Uh, I am Mike Andrews, president of the Jack Miller Center, and I'm happy to welcome you all to our webinar on the problem of government labor relations from party machines to public sector unions. Uh, a quick few words about the Jack Miller Center before we get to the main event. Uh, the Jack Miller Center exists to revive the teaching and study of our nation's founding principles. And we do this by working with and supporting scholars throughout the country. Our mission is to both uh, instill deeper knowledge among students about the ideals underlying our country, but to also foster an appreciation of the great achievements of our country while we at the same time fully acknowledge the failures that we've uh, had along the way. Uh, and I think our work is more important than ever given how so much scholarship and teaching at, in colleges and universities these days is politically motivated. Uh, to date, our network of 1,000 professors have taught over 1 million students since the inception of the Jack Miller Center 15 years ago. And uh, we have recently expanded our reach into second, uh, secondary education with our high school uh, teachers initiative. Um, and uh, speaking of our network of scholars, it is a pleasure to have uh, a longtime member of the Jack Miller Center community of scholars with us today. Uh, one who I think is a shining example of the sort of professors who populate our network. Uh, so welcome, Dan. Dan DeSalvo is professor and chair of political science at the Colin Powell School at the City College of New York uh, and a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, his scholarship focuses on American politics, elections, labor unions, state government, and uh, public policy. Uh, he is the author of Engines of Change, Party Factions in American Politics, uh, Government Against Itself, Public Union Power and Its Consequences, uh, Professor DeSalvo also uh, writes often for uh, scholarly and popular uh, publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, National Affairs, American Interest, and the New York Daily News. He is also uh, co-editor of the scholarly jour journal, The Forum, a journal of applied research in contemporary politics. Uh, Dan has a long and storied history with the Jack Miller Center. Uh, he has attended summer institutes in 2005, 2011, and 2014. Uh, as well as a half dozen other JMC seminars and workshops over the years. Uh, this fall, Dan uh, will be teaching a JMC funded uh, a graduate level course uh, called Confronting the Constitution for working high school civics, te uh, civics teachers in New York City through the City College of New York's School of Education. The course offers teachers a rare opportunity to uh, directly consider the ideas that inform the creation and development of America's political system and to enliven their curriculum with uh, primary source documents. Uh, of course, I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Tom Cleveland, who's our academic programs officer, who will be moderating the event. But uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Dan for a brief uh, introductory presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. and um, and. Thanks to everyone at the Jack Miller Center. It's been a real honor uh, to have been involved with the Jack Miller Center almost since its inception. Um, I hate to date myself and say that that was nearly 15 years ago, um, but the Jack Miller Center has been you know, very important in my own uh, intellectual life and intellectual development. It's also uh, supported a number of uh, events and programs, including Consti Constitution Day speakers at City College. So I can also say that this uh, you know, at least a few hundred, if not a few thousand students at City College uh, who've been touched by uh, support from the Jack Miller Center. So, uh, so thank you both for that introduction and for the opportunity to speak and, and, and enjoy this webinar this afternoon. Um, so without further ado, let me just get, I'll give some brief remarks and then I look forward to, to all, any and all questions. Um, I, the first thing to say is, you know, Americans love to debate the size of government. You know, the issue is a central cleavage between our two political parties today. But in this debate, it's rarely asked, does size really matter? And one could argue that the quality of government is different from, and even more important than, the size of government. One can find examples of governments in terms of the number of public employees relative to private sector employees, and the amount of money spent as a percentage of GDP, even these large governments that are quite ineffective, while others are paragons of effectiveness. Think of a comparison, say, between Brazil and Denmark. Uh, 
On the other hand, some small governments by the same metrics uh, are very effective and others very ineffective. Think of Hong Kong versus Guatemala. So I think Alexander Hamilton best summed up this, this issue of government effectiveness in The Federalist where he wrote a government ill-executed, whatever it may be in theory, must be in practice a bad government. So a really fruitful line of inquiry is to analyze what government is actually able to do in a given society and what's the cost of it doing it. Um, it today in the wooden language of political science, analysts often speak of state capacity to signify a government's ability or its lack thereof to carry out key tasks and you could say penetrate society and impose its will. And a central issue uh, governing American political life, and you could say going all the way back to at least the 1820s, is exactly this question of state capacity and how it has developed. And the United States is fairly unique in this regard for a number of reasons, as I'll try to sketch out briefly. A major problem in American political life, again, going all the way back to the 1820s, has been how to control the inherent po political power of government's own employees. One could say that, and in some ways this wasn't fully anticipated by the founders, but it emerged nonetheless that government employees soon began to form a powerful faction in their own right. And recall, you know, Madison's famous definition of a faction in Federalist Number 10, where he defined it as a number of citizens who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. By pursuing their occupational interest in better pay, better benefits, and more job security, public employees have become a powerful political force in American political life whose interests did not always chime with the public interest. So that's gonna, this issue of the political power of government's own employees and how that's been managed or handled uh, really over the whole sweep of American politics. I'm gonna try to sketch that really briefly um, this afternoon. And you could say that public employees emerged as factions in two distinct modes. The first was the party machine and the second, and that brings us up to the present, was the labor union. Let's consider the first. You could say that egalitarianism in the United States arrived before bureaucracy and democracy, at least beginning with um, universal white male suffrage, arrived before the existence of a professional civil service. This is very different from the European context where uh, bureaucracies and professional civil service developed under monarchies and came before democracy. And this, this different sequencing has really different implications for American democracy as compared to the development of European states. The result in the American case was that from the 1820s onward, a, a party patronage system developed in state and local government in which parties sought to capture public resources and then redistribute them to their supporters in exchange for their votes. And with the rise of political parties, government employees themselves became cogs in the party machine. You could say that the political parties of the 19th century sought to win elections in, in part or sometimes in completely in order to capture government resources, especially government jobs. And then government employees would themselves kick back parts of their salary, would do parts of their uh, jobs on work time for the party machine. And winning elections made patronage jobs, you could say the fruits to be harvested. As uh, New York State Senator William Marcy famously put it in 1828, quote, to the victor belong the spoils of the enemy. And the spoils system as it came to be known was the one by which party machines decided who got government jobs on the basis of partisan loyalty, not on the basis of competence or ability or merit. And the advantages accrued to parties in power, especially at the state and local government level which really in the 19th century in particular really did almost all of the work in domestic policy of government. But this often resulted in an excess of government spending, corruption, and self-dealing. 
Part of, parties entrenched themselves through what amounted to, some people have suggested, a form of legalized bribery. Because parties were so were often stronger than the bureaucracy, they often, you could say, overawed it. And consequently, bureaucracy or state capacity in the United States for much of the 19th and, uh, and 20th century remained very high cost, but low capacity, meaning it was not able to really effectively carry out many core functions, or could it only do so at very high cost. Advocates of administrative expertise or of a stronger bureaucracy their task was to reduce party power. They could only do that by getting rid of the party machines. Therefore, the progressive reformers embarked on a campaign to defeat the party machines beginning, you could say, as early as the 1870s, sparking a war that lasted really until the 1960s. And pro progressive reformers sought to change party structures to reduce the power of the party bosses. And their primary tool was civil service reform. But they also called for the direction of uh, the direct election of U.S. senators, advocated direct democracy methods such as the initiative, referendum, and recall, and fought primary fought for primary elections, which would take away the power to nominate candidates from the parties and hand it to voters. In short, much of the substance of American politics for nearly a century after the Civil War was directly or indirectly devoted to addressing the problem of party control over the bureaucracy. It was only by the 1960s that many American governments were able to build competent bureaucracies based on civil service rules and merit systems. Yet almost as soon as the party bosses were defeated and the ink was dry on the civil service statutes that professionalized the bureaucracy, a new method of mobilizing the resources of public employees for political purposes emerged. So this is the second mode, which is the public employee union. From 1959 to 1984, a majority of the 50 states adopted laws granting collective bargaining rights and union security provisions to various categories of state and local empl employees. States that adopted these statutes also happened to be the country's largest and most populous, such that by the end of the period, a majority of state and local government workers were covered by union contracts. Government union membership thus uh, rapidly rose from about 5 million workers in 1973 to over 8 million today. And today, as many of you all already know, public employee unions constitute roughly half of, the, uh, of all workers belonging to unions in the United States, even though public employees constitute less than a fifth of the entire uh, US labor market. Public sector unions have become among the most powerful interest groups at all levels of American government. They shape public policy from the bottom up through collective bargaining and the top down through lobbying and electioneering. They're regularly among the top donors to candidates and parties at all levels, mostly to Democrats, but to some Republicans as well. And you could say that the aim of public employee political activity for the most part is for government to go grow. And American government has become very large. It spends almost as much as the uh, supposedly statist governments of Europe, especially if you look at the federal, state and local levels combined. It maintains policies touching on virtually every aspect of human life. However, the size of American government remains somewhat obscure. The federal government achieves this by keeping taxes low and borrowing to pay for many of its activities, um, often called debt financing, and it administers many programs through what political scientist John DiUlio has called proxies, the leading proxy being state and local government, rather than by hiring lots of federal government workers. So that today, the federal government employs roughly the same number of full-time bureaucrats as it did 30 years ago. And instead of employing more workers directly, it outsources tasks to, to other levels of government. As a result, state and local government workforce has tripled over the past 30 years to some 14.9 million full-time employees today. The resulting problem is that lines of authority are often confused and bureaucratic capacity constrained by such complex government as is generated by our federal system. 
accountability becomes very hard to maintain and responsibility is diffused. The even deeper problem is that unionization of state and local government employees has made it almost impossible to bring about meaningful reform of state and local government insofar as the unions oppose many of the reforms proposed. The consequences are huge because the inability to reform government means that its performance suffers, state capacity is reduced, and public trust in key institutions declines. Consider police and public schools, both much in the news lately. They are the institutions of government with which Americans most frequently engage. Police protect our most vulnerable citizens and allow communities to thrive. Schools offer opportunities for social mobility. There are thousands, of course, of heroic and devoted police officers and school teachers. But unionization and collective bargaining have enmeshed these two crucial government functions in red tape that too often protect the inept and the abusive. By creating a government empowered to extensively regulate business, tax society, redistribute income, and much, much more, the problem is to, today is really how to restrain government such that liberty and self-government are protected, and really to consider how to make public policies effective, meaning to increase state capacity such that the government can act without it being incredibly expensive to act. One thinks of a whole variety of areas from healthcare to education, where the United States far outspends um, its other European nations in these areas, but for uh, paltry or meager results in comparative perspective. And that really means reconsidering the role of unions in government. It's no wonder then, given some of these basic facts, that public employee unions have been at the center of the nation's political debate for the last decade and remain so today. To set the United States on a path to compete globally, to adjust to rapid technological change, and to assist those most in need of government support in the 21st century, American government has to become more flexible and responsive. In, and in that, in short, it needs to improve its bureaucratic capacity. Moving in that direction, of course, will be contentious, since public employee unions today have a huge stake in preserving the status quo. In sum, we're still fighting the same battle over how to make uh, American government more effective at lower cost, meaning how to improve the quality of government by better managing um, the political power of government's own employees. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. You covered a lot of ground there, uh, all the way from the founding or before uh, up to the current moment. Um, so we've already gotten some questions uh, through email or other means, and I'll turn to those in a little bit. But um, I guess I wanted to uh, parts of your comments. Um, as I understand it, there's several ways of dealing with uh, public employees or government employees that we've tried out. Uh, the founders, it seems, uh, did not, as uh, in my understanding, you would say they did not see foresee the power of government employees when they were arranging our government and did not prepare for that danger, which allowed for once a party system developed for this faction of government uh, employees to take hold. Um, what, are the, um, what, are the, what are the disadvantages of that system, I guess, to begin with? Well, of the party system, you'd say, uh, in fairness to the founders, of course, they yes. both were, many were opposed to political yeah. parties. And um, of course, then many of them also went on to found parties, right. most probably Jefferson. Um, but it wasn't really until the 1820s and under the guidance of Martin Van Buren right. that political parties and the idea of two-party competition um, was able to instill itself. You could say their focus on the federal government, meaning designing a constitution for the federal government, in some ways, combined with that hostility or skepticism about political parties, led the founders to, you could say, to overlook this issue of political parties and that the federal government was going to be while more vigorous than the government under the Articles, was stronger than the government under the Articles, it was still going to be relatively limited, meaning the state and local governments were going to do 
the primary work the government was supposed to do. So therefore they didn't really anticipate, especially in the early Republic, a huge number of political uh, public employees becoming this powerful force in their own right. Uh, many people agreed to serve in the relatively small and limited uh, federal bureaucracy in the beginning, um, in part out of a kind of noblesse oblige, they would come in for a little while and then uh, go back out. And that really changes by the 1820s as the, you know, the country in a way democratizes more and the argument becomes, well, anyone can do some of these jobs and then how do we have, uh, make these connections between people and government and parties become this mechanism. What else might be said on behalf of the 19th century right. party system um, and the party machines? Well, a lot could be said. Um, first, I mean, at the level of the constitutional principle, one might say that, or the parties themselves would have said in the 19th century, that we are really the defenders of federalism. The parties maintain right. local control and decentralize right. American government. They're kind of uh, the anchor that keeps the government from becoming too centralized. And that so in that sense, they defend a kind of constitutional federalism. Mm -hmm. The other thing that might be said on behalf of these parties was that they were very effective at linking citizens to government. They did a lot of things, integrating immigrants. I mean, one thinks of the famous Tammany mm -hmm. Hall in New York, you know, obviously demonized in all Thomas Nast cartoons in the 19th century, but Tammany also did a lot of good for the Irish, um, and then later waves of immigrant groups. Um, was it the most democratic organization in the world? Surely not. Uh, was it often corrupt? Sure. Uh, right. We have, you know, the the Tweed Building today, which is where uh, the Department of Education is in New York City, which is a, was a huge, massive boondoggle. Um, so many, one could point to many examples of that. But it was very effective at integrating immigrants. Um, yeah. It was not hostile to business. Um, so that would be just a beginning list of things that could be said. Right, so then just moving ahead, I mean, just looking at the spoil system and the party machine, you might, as you began say, that just looks like plain old corruption. You bribe people with jobs to, to turn public resources towards your supporters. Um, and you gave some arguments. I mean, the, the founders and the progressive reformers would sort of agree that looks like a kind of corruption perhaps. Um, the, so I guess I want to say, what's the, let's take the next step. What's the progressive reformer argument? Um, what strength does that argument have? Well, uh, clearly there was an, an issue that the, the progressives weren't, you know, wrong about everything. They had, um, there was a, a major change going on, you could say, from the post-Civil War period. A, a huge rise, um, you know, any brief chart of showing immigration patterns to the United States a huge wave that crests right about 1910 yeah. um, of people coming from Europe, especially Southern and Eastern Europe, um, that had to be integrated. Massive change in the, you know, the Gilded Age, uh, political economy of the United States, industrialization. Following on that urbanization, people leaving farm for factory. Um, you know, you could say that if you ask someone a hundred years ago, if they thought, you know, farm employment was gonna be below 10% in the United States today, they would have thought you were totally crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but as new manufacturing enterprises develop, and could the state keep up with all of these massive changes? Could the limited government of the founders really have addressed that? That's mm -hmm. really the progressive right. core critique. Right. And they said, well, we think we can do it, or some, some argued you needed to go further and you know, get rid of the constitution or something, right. you know, things like that, or, massively change it, and this is various versions of Woodrow Wilson. But others uh, said, well, this, we can do it un under existing systems, but we have to get these corrupt parties out of the way. Right. Because they're, they're appointing you know, their cousins and brothers and uncles and nephews to all these jobs, regardless of whether they're any good or competent. Um, and this is slowing down um, any effective implementation of policies that could address some of these changes. So the parties mm -hmm. were really uh, what they saw as, and they were probably, you know, half right or right to some degree, was what was opposing a kind of effective government. We we can't institute any policies to ensure, you know, the safety and health of uh, citizens uh, with all of these groups standing in the way, and they all need kickbacks and handouts right. and no work jobs <laughs> along the way. It's just too costly to do it. 
So that would sort of be the, the progressive argument at this point. Yeah, so then the next step, as I understood your account, is the development of these public sector unions. I mean, it seems to me there could be a sort of facile comparison between the party machines uh, capturing government resources and distributing jobs and the role of public sector unions. That is, they could be seen as corrupt in a similar way. That is, capturing public resources and giving them to private groups. Is that a, is that indeed a facile comparison? Um, um, or, yeah, go ahead. I, I wouldn't make that comparison. Yeah. I mean, I do think they're, they're, they're quite different. You yes. know, the parties, um, you know, while they had their downsides, clearly, also had a, a lot of upsides. Now, okay. employee unions, you could, I think one can argue, do have certain upsides, but right. the upsides tend to accrue um, less broadly, and they're more concentrated either on public employees directly themselves, hmm. um, rather than, say, benefiting the larger community, uh, mm -hmm. one might argue. Um, and that's been one of the issues that many of the effects of public sector unions are more concentrated on their their own members, meaning winning better pay, better benefits. And that's even different from private sector unions, which yes. many have argued have broader effects on the political economy. You know, economists have a funny word for talking about this, but it's called threat mm -hmm. effects, meaning if right. private sector unions are strong, surrounding firms, uh, will be worried about preventing unionization and will therefore raise wages or improve working conditions just to stave off an mm -hmm. impulse for, a, um, for unionization. And people don't really see that if one police department is unionized, it's not as if right. the other down the road is gonna say, oh, we better unionize too to block the, that doesn't really happen. So those kind of threat effects where you could see those changes of having effects in the broader community right. um, aren't as present. Um, so I guess I want to get to the, 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 the current moment um, in two ways. The first having to do with what is the status of public sector unions now? There was recently this Janus decision, and you've written about this in National Affairs, about the extent to which this Janus decision um, really threatens public sector unions or to what extent it doesn't. And then second of all, I'll have a follow-up about this um, police unions question, which maybe has to be dealt with separately. Yeah, I, I, I bracket those two. Yeah. And separate them. Yeah. Um, on the Janus decision, so two years ago, June, um, the Supreme Court heard an important case um, about whether um, public employee unions were inherently political entities such that requiring all workers represented by unions to pay into union coffers either by becoming union members and paying dues or if you refuse to become a union member um, you couldn't be compelled to become a member that would violate your first amendment rights to freedom of association but you could be compelled to pay what was called an agency fee right it's often set that close to the same amount as the dues um, the effect of agency fee laws, which prevailed um, in about 22 states, was that it would just provide a powerful incentive for people to join the union. If you were going to have to pay, you know, a thousand dollars a year in dues, um, or you were going to have to pay 950 as an agency fee, um, you know, many people who didn't have strong convictions or strong preferences on this issue would just concede and join the union. Um, and these matters were often not well explained at HR meetings attended by union officials when new public employees are hired. The court uh, struck down those agency fee provisions of state laws in 22 states, which now means that if you decline to join the union or if you're a union member and you opt out, you don't have to pay anything to the union. And many people thought that the Janus decision would thus uh, decrease the amount of revenue that public employee unions were uh, collecting, as well as decrease dramatically the number of members, meaning people on the right and the left predicted that there would be this massive opting out. Um, my own work to date, and I think well, the, the data that's available show that that so far hasn't happened, meaning people were expecting a much bigger attrition than there's really been. On the other hand, it should be said that the Janus decision really did have a big impact on union finances. Um, 
even consider really strong union states like California. So uh, California, say the California Teachers Association, very powerful teachers union. 90% of California's teachers belong to the CTA. But that 10% that doesn't was paying an agency fee, but now they're not. So the CTA in effect by Janus took about a 10% budget cut. Um, so that's a significant uh, loss of revenue. Now the question for the union, public employee unions going forward is how can they retain members and recruit new uh, members when, as new people are hired and older workers either leave public service uh, or retire. And that's going to be a big question going forward. And a number of states have actually taken steps by passing new laws that give the unions lots of advantages to help them either retain or recruit uh, new members going forward. Right. Um, as a way of approaching this police question, um, the, the criticism I see you leveling against public sector unions has to do, as I see, uh, with the danger or the impropriety of taking public resources and shuttling them towards some private interest in a way, something like that. There's additionally, as I, far as I understand it, the, the danger of the fiscal state of state governments and so forth being tied up with pension obligations that they might not be able to uh, uh, successfully carry out. In addition to that, though, I think there's this question of accountability, which you've talked about, um, which you could apply to things like teachers unions, right? It's maybe hard to fire a teacher, and that's something bad. Um, but that would, seems connected also to this police question. Um, so I guess I just want to ask you, what, what, is, what kinds of criticisms are you actually leveling? And do they apply universally to the various kinds of unions? So for example, um, Ben Kleinerman, who's on our board, asked, what's the difference between uh, police unions and, and uh, teachers unions? Um, I think we also had a, a question from Sarah, whether um, it's the same problem with teachers unions that they cannot be held accountable like police can. So, sorry, that was a little rambling, but I hope you can uh, successfully no, respond. I, I, to think, I think you've got the gist. Yeah. I'd say that, you know, people who are concerned about the effects of public employee unions really have um, two things that they're really worried about. Yeah. The first is cost, yeah. which is to say, insofar as uh, collective bargaining laws require uh, government agencies to negotiate with unions on basically three core subjects, pay, benefits, and work rules. Um, I should say under the benefits category, in most places, pensions are not bargained, are not part of collective bargaining. They're set by state right. standards. It's right. often healthcare issues and things that are under the benefits uh, mm -hmm. heading and work rules. Um, so the first is the issue of cost. Now cost comes in in two ways, not just the fact that through collective bargaining that tends to um, raise wages, so you're paying more for your police protection, you're paying more for your fire protection if you're allowing collective bargaining in your local governments. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, an issue is just, again, thinking back to this concept of um, bureaucratic capacity, you're saying, well, we want to carry out these key tasks. We want fire protection, we want police protection, we want uh, education of our children, um, but we are, to carry these out, it's just going to cost us more. Right. right? It's going to require uh, higher taxes or greater borrowing um, or some other fit mechanism for financing this. Now, the other criticism it has to do is connected to this in the sense that it also involves cost, and this goes to the issue of work rules. Right. Um, and that's about negotiating under, uh, you could say, for job conditions or conditions of employment. This can often mean that, you know, like many people, I would like to work less for more money. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of ways in terms of work rules. For example, take the New York City um, school teachers contract. It specifies down to the minute per day the amount of face time and engagement that a public school teacher okay. must engage um, to be meeting the contractual standards. Um, now, so you can see in these kind of complex work rules, how much time has to be allotted, it constrains the flexibility of management 
to do things or to try right. things. And it makes the bureaucracy, you could say, more sclerotic, such that, well, we need more people to carry out uh, just this task because uh, one employee can't be assigned more of certain duties, even if they'd be willing to do them. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there's a kind of bureaucratic sclerosis that comes in that also contributes to this cost. Right. The work rules then also have this other, so you could say, second effect, which is the innov that insofar as the unions become powerful political entities and don't want to change the, their ways of doing things, and they want to try to, in a sense, have ways of doing things that benefit their own employees, right? That's what the membership wants. I, I want certain rules. I want greater job security. I want more protections. I'd like to work a little less for the same amount of money. Um, all of th those basic attitudes get translated into public employee unions really being opposed to reform. And this goes to your, and that makes trying right. to do anything or experiment um, in improving lots of pieces of American government really difficult. And then this goes to the question about, right. uh, you know, you could say accountability. And accountability is deeply undermined, both for, um, public school teachers and for, for police officers in many cases, under this heading of work rules, both mm. for police and for teachers um, are negotiated all of the disciplinary procedures in many cases. Um, some of these in the police context are also set by state statute and are actually bargained. It's called law enforcement officers bills of rights. Okay. But if you're a teacher and you're accused of misconduct all the investigation, all the steps that must be followed are pretty much spelled out in the collective bargaining agreement. Mm. And to fire a teacher for poor performance is nearly impossible in many places. Los Angeles School District, one study showed it took about five years and over $100,000 in legal fees to fire a teacher for poor performance. Right. And, you know, for police officers, it can often be very difficult to fire officers, um, you know, in the unless some serious thing of misconduct as we saw recently in Minneapolis has occurred, yeah. but that's cold comfort. You know, in many yeah. cases, it, there's no mystery in the school or in the police uh, department, who are the bad apples, but management can't really do much about it. Um, you can go, I mean, anyone with children knows you can go to the schools and everyone knows who the, the poor, uh, poor teachers are and who the good teachers are. Same in police departments, but management's hands are tied about doing anything about it because due to the work rules. And so is there a possibility that, so we have a question actually from our chairman, Jack Miller, uh, asking, could you have a national policy that restricts the unions to just negotiating for wages and benefits? Which I, I, I thought might mean something like wages and benefits rather than things like work rules. Is yeah. that a, yeah. The answer is yes. Um, the, I mean, it might be open to constitutional challenge. Uh, I mean, uh -huh. one could imagine arguments based on federal gr federalism grounds and uh, police protection grounds. Uh -huh. But the U.S. Congress has considered at, at least two points. I mean, public imp the whole difference, the whole reason state governments really are the key actors in when it comes to public employee labor relations is because state and local employees were excluded from coverage by the Wagner Act of 1935, which is right. sort of the foundational statute uh, of federal legislation for private sector unions. But public employees were excluded. Now, at two other major points, Congress did at least think about passing some kind of national uh, statute determining collective bargaining and unionization rights for state and local government. The first was early in the Kennedy administration. For public, um, for public employees? Is that, did I understand you correctly? Yeah, for public employees, right? So to take, instead of having this patchwork that we've had of state laws, you would move to a, a, a national or federal law. So early in the Kennedy administration, this was considered, uh, many in the Kennedy administration were opposed to um, to ultimately decided this wasn't a good idea. They didn't want especially Defense Department employees to be unionizing. The result was a major executive order by Kennedy, which allows for some kind of bargaining, even though that word collective bargaining is, appears nowhere in Kennedy's executive order. Um, then 
Um, in, under the Carter administration in the mid 1970s, there was a real effort which came close, more bills were taken up in Congress. There was actually a legislative push for sort of national collective bargaining statute um, for, state, for public employees, state and local. Um, but that didn't pass, it ultimately didn't pass. So in principle, a national law could be passed, um, but there hasn't been much of a drive for that. I suspect uh, it's, um, this is an interesting moment as I understand it, because there are uh, libertarians typically will oppose public sector unions or be, and also be skeptical of uh, private sector unions. Uh, conservatives will be skeptical of public sector unions, except maybe not so skeptical of police unions. And liberals uh, will tend to be supportive of public sector unions and at least in speech be suspicious of uh, police unions. Seems like it is a moment where at least police unions are coming under, there could be some kind of coalition, maybe that doesn't make sense, but there is a focus on this one question and seeing the, the difficulties with uh, having a public sector union with those. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, to, today in, in the wake of um, George Floyd's death and uh, tragic and horrible death in Minneapolis, um, police unions are under the microscope in a way that they've probably never really been nationally. Mm -hmm. um, I think your characterization of general attitudes uh, towards police unions is, is fairly accurate which is to say um, conservatives have been skeptical of uh, public employee unions in general, but um, have a little bit given uh, police unions a pass. They were not included, for example, in Scott Walker's Act 10 in Wisconsin. Right, yeah. Uh, and, you know, one can see conservatives reasoning here has often been, well, we don't want to criticize the police union because we worry that that's going to bleed into criticism of the police. And we want to support the police. We want to. We we believe in law and order. Um, it's, a, it's a foundational or basic task of government. Um, even the libertarians concede the need for the night watchman. Mm. Uh, now, uh, liberals, on the other hand, are in a little, slightly more delicate position. They want to. Um, they like unions. They believe in public sector unions for the most part today. Although, interestingly, that wasn't always the case. Um, oh, right. FDR, for example, was a champion of private sector unions, but opposed to public sector unions. Mm. I've, I've always wondered why FDR's position didn't, doesn't carry more weight with, um, mm -hmm. with liberals today, but it doesn't. Um, so, but you can see, obviously, uh, many liberals are skeptical of, of the police and very skeptical of their unions. Um, you can see why they sort of see police yeah. as the bad proletariat. Um, there's no cultural affinity uh, between, um, or in the Marxist phrase, they're the, they're the lumpen proletariat, the, the mm -hmm. reactionary forces of false, false consciousness, consciousness right. um, and if you want to get fancy. Right. Uh, so you could see why there's not a, uh, a connection there. I would say that police unions are a bit different. Okay. I would say they're compared to other public sector unions, which have been overwhelmingly supportive of Democrats, police unions have supported politically both Democrats right. and Republicans. They are more bipartisan in their campaign finance donations and so on. So you can see why Republicans would be, um, want to tread lightly before cutting off a source of support. Um, you can also see that um, police unions are different in the sense that police do have unique or slightly different jobs that really do uh, end up with a, just inherent in what they're doing, an adversarial relationship with the communities that they serve. Many people don't really want justice or the law enforced a lot of the time. <laughs> um, they're having a loud party. They don't want the cops to show up and tell them to turn it down. Um, and that's just the nature of, of police work, even in the humdrum example I just gave. So in that sense, police unions are different because they, they stand out politically um, and because their jobs involve this conflictual relation with the public that doesn't really exist in other sectors. Right. Um, as, uh, I'm gonna go to some questions we had from the audience. Um, Seth actually asked a couple of questions uh, from two points of view. One is that uh, 
I can find his question. He says, do public sector unions grant undemocratic influence to unelected and unaccountable government employees? But then he also asks um, whether it really is a, bit, a zero sum con uh, contest between the unions and the public. Uh, so to take the other side, uh, is there any kind of contribution to the common good that might come through the public sector union? That is, is it really all bad? Um, so I, I thought I'd just try to prompt you to see if you can say something in the other sure. direction. Um, well, you could say a couple of things on, on the side of public employee unions. Yeah. First and foremost, um, they're good for the employees themselves, right? The right. evidence suggests um, that they do increase wages, they do improve benefits, and right. they do improve job security. So uh, for the public employees themselves, the, the unions in general are doing and they're part of the public, you could say. Much of, much of, the, much of what uh, they're advertising. Right. Now, there have been some ascent, uh, attempts to show threat effects from government employment uh, to surrounding firms or industries. Um, but so far, none of, none of the big empirical studies have been published. Um, there's one I know of that has tried to establish this. Mm -hmm. Another is um, that public employee unions today are absolutely crucial in sustaining the labor movement at all now. Oh, right, yeah. So that, you know, really the, the private sector labor movement is really on life support and it really needs the aid and assistance mm -hmm. of public sector unions. And so that could be, you could say a political advantage looking ahead if something like, you know, income inequality is going to be addressed uh, maybe one of the best tools would be how are we going to be able to get more money to flow to you know pr pr service sector workers we're going to need a maybe a stronger labor movement and only with the assistance of the public sector unions today could the private sector really get off its back and then third you might say that um, public employee unions you know could not only help low wage workers even without unionization and probably the biggest example that could be pointed to of doing that um, was the fight for 15 to raise the minimum wage in right. recent years and in a number of places and that was often financed mm -hmm. um, by uh, public employee unions um, or quasi public employee unions CIU like 1199 in new york um, and that by raising the wage floor is again you know a small and incremental step you know, towards, um, you could say, lessening income inequality. Now, lots more could be said about whether mm -hmm. a stronger private sector union movement combined with higher minimum wages will actually benefit in the long run um, sure. people at the lower end of the right. uh, wage distribution. One could argue, well, it will probably just speed automation and it won't help them um, and they'll have no job instead of a, a poor paying one. Um, but that's a, that's a debate for the economists. Yeah, I, I, and just on this point, it's it's just in, certainly an interesting political moment. So um, Mary Kay Henry, president of SEIU, in an interview recently said, um, we need to have a conversation about expelling the International Union of Police Associations, associations from the labor movement. Uh, I think uh, Trumka of AFL-CIO takes a different position, um, but that's a it's an interesting situation for the labor movement where they're, they have commitments to, um, to you know, combating uh, police abuse. In some cases, they represent some police or security guards, or as you were saying, they, it's in their interest to support the union movement generally, including police unions, but there's some pressure on them uh, to go the other way in this case, it looks like. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're divided. And Organized labor has been divided over a number of questions in recent years, in fact, and even including um, how to deal with the public private divide within its own ranks. Um, you know, just so taking it one example, and then I'll turn to the Trump, uh, uh, Mary mm -hmm. Henry example. You know, here in my home state of New York, you know, many of the construction unions have been quite critical of the public sector unions, uh, in part for driving up all kinds of costs. That is through pay packages and benefits, many of the private sector unions are saying, well, it's making things too costly 
um, and driving up the cost of living such that our members who aren't enjoying as good a deal are ending up with pension envy and it's creating conflict because the, the offer for the two sectors is too far apart. And this was most famously made, point most famously made by Gary LaBarbera, one of the heads of the construction unions in New York City. Now the example of the police unions between Trumpka and, and Mary Kay Henry, there's been a huge divide between SEIU nationally mm -hmm. and the AFL-CIO. They left the AFL-CIO and formed another uh, uh, organization called Change to Win with another group of unions. Mm -hmm. so, there's a long standing division. Now the AFL-CIO has more police unions as part of its affiliates. Right. The Change to Win Coalition has less. So you could right. say that Mary Kay Henry has less to lose um, than, than Trumpka does. Uh, but you can see, I think liberals, have, you know, in some ways are now in this delicate position where they are favoring police union reform, sort mm -hmm. of, um, at least broadly, but they, don't want that to spill over into right. public sector union reform generally, meaning right. we'll be fine. Even you could say that the Dean of uh, organized labor law scholars uh, at, at Harvard, um, Benjamin Sachs has mm -hmm. come out in favor of restricting the subjects of collective bargaining in state law for police unions. Uh, but, you know, they don't want that same principle to be generalized to say right. teachers unions uh, or, or other public employee unions. They say, well, this is just specific to the police that they shouldn't be allowed to bargain over disciplinary procedures. Um, so that's been an interesting shift. So they, they want to make this one exception for the police as fundamentally different. Yeah. But I guess my view is that in principle, there isn't that much difference um, mm -hmm. between what's happening in the police and education and other contexts. I want to at least get to one more question uh, from the audience, and it's about the uh, the Camden, New Jersey model of police reform. Um, so if, if you feel competent to uh, address that, that's from Robert. Um, I, I feel competent enough to, to, to be a pundit about it, sure. Um, well, that's the question. Is it a model? Well, I should have been clear. Is, that, is that a good model? Oh, for yeah. the, for I appreciate the, Robert's uh, question. It's, it's sufficiently yeah, general. Right. I should have posed it more, uh, more affirmatively. Yeah. Um, well, you can see the Camden model shows what was required to get around the, the union contract and right. to change an organizational culture. And this goes to the sort of larger point that I was making initially, which is that insofar as unions and collective bargaining and government set up a situation where it makes it extremely difficult to change an organizational culture, whether that's a police department mm -hmm. or a public school. Uh, that's really the, the issue of these work rules. So what Camden did was essentially disband its police department yes. and then it could get out of the union contracts and so on and build a new police department. In fact, hiring back many of the officers right. that were previously there, but then they could pick and choose. They could say, we know who are the good officers and we want to bring them back and we want to do better at recruitment. And this will give us by building from the ground up, we could sort of start over. And in some ways you can see that that's why teachers unions and in, in an, an analogy find um, charter schools so threatening, which yeah. is, okay, well, we can go and we'll create something from the ground up that doesn't start out with all the union rules governing and structuring the school day. And we'll, recruit the teachers that we want and we'll, you know, and we'll make a more effective or better organization. And to the extent that the charter schools succeed, uh, that obviously puts the traditional public schools dominated by teachers unions on the back foot. Um, so we are basically coming to the end. Um, I, I will actually share the results of that poll we did at the beginning. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, looks like we had, uh, 41% thinking it was illegitimate for the DNC to, to put their finger on the scale and uh, 59 against, um, or was it legitimate? Sorry, I said it the opposite no. way. And, and you can tell something from our audience and so far as 88% think there should be a decrease in the number of federal government employees. Um, 
interesting result. Uh, um, yeah. Can I comment? Uh, yeah, go ahead. We have yeah, some time. They yeah. are interesting. Um, yeah. Well, the first one is really quite interesting insofar as it shows um, the depths to which political parties have fallen. Um, you know, I guess in my own view, I would take the opposite position. Yes, it would be legitimate. That's the whole point of the party. They wanted Hillary Clinton to win. They didn't want Bernie Sanders. The party should kind of have a force or power um, a, a, of its own in its own right, right? So yes. um, I guess that one's very interesting and it shows the kind of, uh, so f the, how far our world is today from let's say the party machines of, yeah. of the 19th century, which you know basically in the smoke filled rooms in the classic phrase, chose who the nominees were going to be. Um, the other question is also interesting because it goes to the point that the federal government really hasn't increased or decreased its employees in 30 years. Yeah. Uh, so if we're thinking about the size or shape of American government, it's, we really need to think more broadly about its, its proxies, meaning that all the increase in government employment is actually occurring at the state and local level, and no one's watching that. And that goes to this point about the obscure size of American government. Um, so both 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 interesting results of the poll. Great, thank you. Well, hey Dan, it uh, looks like we're coming to the uh, end of our session, but uh, thank you so much for a uh, really great discussion. Uh, we really appreciate it. My pleasure, Mike. Okay, and uh, to everyone who is viewing, if you would like to learn more uh, about the Jack Miller Center or to support us in our work, you can find a link to the Jack Miller Center uh, in your chat box. All right, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Tom, my pleasure. Thanks, everyone.